Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cat Talk Radio. I'm your host, Molly DeVos. And today we're joined by Dr. Brian Hurley. He is the National Medical Director for Amerivet Veterinary Partners and is on our show regularly to talk about cat health issues. And this time we're going to talk about feline kidney disease. So welcome to the show, Dr. Hurley. Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, let's start off with Happy New Year. <laughs> That's right. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy holidays. I Absolutely. Since before Christmas. <laughs> Very true. So let's start with, um, I think it always helps people to visualize where, where an organ is that we're talking about. And since we're talking about the kidneys, let's, let's look at a graphic here before we jump in and, um, and have you just talk a little bit about this graphic and where the kidneys are. No, absolutely. So the, the kidneys are, the, this diagram is off a little bit. The kidneys look to be a little further back so than they normally would be in the cat. But the kidneys are really just after the end of the rib cage. And you can feel them on the right and the left side. Um, so when we're doing our physical exam and the, and the patients on the table, we can literally feel each of the kidneys by feeling just behind the rib cage on the right side and then doing the same thing on the left side. So in cats, they're very accessible. It's a very accessible organ to us to be able to, uh, feel size shape. So if you think about the kidney, the kidney truly is that kidney bean shape that we associate with that can of bean, kidney bean that you would open up. That is what the kidney kind of looks like um, in the normal phase. As it gets bigger, it loses that shape. Obviously, if it shrinks, it changes as well. But um, the kidney is a fairly important organ within our, you know, within our patients' bodies because they do filter the blood. They get rid of excess water. They get rid of excess minerals and vitamins because, you know, just let's face it, you know, more is not always better. You, if you take too much vitamin, the body has to get rid of it because it doesn't need the, that act, that excess. They also are important in removing the toxins from our body. So anything that, that could be detrimental to the body, the kidneys help get that out of our system. So that's kind of the main function of the, the kidney. They also do help with uh, they generate hormones that will help in red blood cell production, uh, maintaining electrolyte balance, things like that within the system as well. So they serve a pretty important role in helping our bodies maintain homeostasis and, and function appropriately. Yeah. And, and it's this, the oblong red thing here correct right 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 behind the white stomach kind of up towards the top so when you're feeling on your cat it's kind of high on the body then behind the rib cage right it's at the the forward part of what we would consider the abdomen so okay. when you're when you're when you're feeling them you know you're kind of midway you're right behind the rib cage uh so it, that diagram what it does is just kind of says, okay, liver is the first thing at the very front of the uh, abdomen. Then the stomach is next. The kidney is there as well. But if you think about it, the way the liver sits, the stomach is kind of also uh, tucked up against that liver. So they just kind of spread it out a little bit, yeah. which makes it, you know, look like it's further back than it actually is. Be a whole lot easier to do surgery if they were laid out like that diagram, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so let's um, what you know, what is kidney disease? We hear you know kidney disease and renal failure. Are are those terms interchangeable? Are those different things that are happening? The terms are interchangeable uh, in that you know some I tend to use kidney disease as my primary uh, versus, you know, kidney failure or renal failure. So renal disease, kidney, renal kidney are one and the same. Uh, disease, it, we would probably, 
I would use disease more in the early stages of renal issues because once you throw out failure, the you know I think the the psyche of the human parent now is all of a sudden going to be like, oh my gosh, this is the end, yeah. you know. And so we tend to I usually say we have kidney disease, and then as we get into the later stages of kidney disease, turn to the failure component of things. And then ultimately the final stage would be end stage where the kidneys have just shut down. Right. Right. But you can use them, I, you know, I think interchangeably. Um, and I think that's why they also, you know, have the staging of kidney disease now, because that can also kind of help us talk about severity because we're all accustomed that, you know, a level one disease process is you know, less intimidating than say four, you know, stage four. Right. Right. More manageable, I, I would assume. And, and Correct. talk about those stages, how many stages are there and what are some of those early warning signs of, of kidney disease? So we do have a scoring system in kidney disease and it typically is laid out in four primary stages, stages one through four. And what dictates which level one of our feline patients would be in really are a series of tests uh, that, that, that we run. And I'm sure we'll get into those, you know, a little later, but as medicine continues to progress within those stages now, we also can have substages. So instead of it just being level one, level two, now we can have level two A, two B before you get to three. And part of what allows us to do that again is more the diagnostic capabilities and the different tests that we're able to run that would fit them into a certain category. You know, it's not always that clean, but it's a great guideline for discussing where our patients lie because within those stages, what it allows us to do is kind of predict that longevity. Because when we're talking about kidney disease itself, and particularly as it's progressing through the stages, those stages kind of help us discuss the longevity, the, pro the long-term prognosis. So your ones and twos, you know, on average, we're probably looking at close to 1200 days plus. Again, I always stress it's average. It means some don't make it that long, but some exceed it. So, you know, it's, it's just to kind of put a ballpark on what the expectations should be in that stage, where when we get to stages, you know, three and four, you know, all of a sudden at, you know, stage four, we might be talking a hundred days. Right. on average. So that can be a lot more significant and a lot more important discussion to have with the client if we feel they're in that true stage four chronic yeah. kidney disease. But it's, because it's, the other thing that we have to differentiate too is there are acute kidney issues uh, that can throw you into you know having kidney disease. But if you treat that underlying pro process, whether it was a toxin, whether it was an infection, you can pull them out of that. And they go back to normal with treatment. When we're talking chronic, which is, I think, is the basis of this conversation, you know, this is more the wear and tear, the older patients typically that are, are going to be experiencing, you know, that disease process. Yeah. And so, but, but it sounds like what you're saying is if, if a cat parent learns that their cat has been diagnosed with kidney disease, that that's that's pretty much a, this is how your cat is going to die conversation. And it's just managing then the, the process is, is most of, yeah, most of it's management. So, you know, when you think about true chronic kidney disease that, you know, that's going to eventually move into the failure um, mm -hmm. stage potentially, and that's assuming there's no other underlying medical conditions, because I, I, I hate to say, oh, my gosh, it's a death, a death sentence per se. But it could be if everything else stays normal and this is what we're dealing with, it's response to treatment. 
So the better a patient responds to treatment, the longer the 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 longevity. But you know, I, I'm absolutely you know with you that um, it's why it's so important that we manage these and we have a lot of tools you know that can help us help the patient live as, you know, as long as they can. So, you know, to kind of get to that other question that you had is, well, what, how do we even start thinking about our, our cat having kidney disease? And remarkably, it can present a wide variety of ways. The most common thing that owners are going to recognize is the increased drinking, increased peeing typically, because the kidneys are a, a filtering mechanism. They need blood flow through that system. When it is compromised, the body starts to need more water intake to get them to, you know, get that pressure back to where it needs to be. And in doing so, then they start to pee more. And so that's usually the, the biggest sign owners will see. Now, as things progress, you get the weight loss and you get the changes in appetite but let's face it, appetite changes, um, weight loss, you know, cloudy urine, your poor coat, your lethargy, all these things can be anything. You know, we've discussed right. it every, you know, since I've been on the show, we've been talking about if, if you go back and start looking, everything starts with diarrhea, vomiting, weight loss, you know, changes in urination behavior. Right. Um, it's why veterinary medicine is difficult at times because increased urination and increased drinking could be diabetes, hyperthyroidism. It could just be some other illness, but kidneys are on there. And so that's the importance of that, those visits and, and trying to figure it out as quick as we can, because the sooner we start to impact the disease process, the better chance we have at longevity. Sure. And, and, how many times on average does a cat normally urinate? How do we know, you know, when we're cleaning the litter box, I always tell people that's a really good way to monitor your cat's right. natural excrements. You know, how many times a day does it, does it poop? And how many times a day do they normally urinate? How will we know what's increased? Right. So I, I think in general, we know that cats are probably going to urinate anywhere from two to four, depending on what article you read. Some will say as much as six times a day. Um, but that two to four probably would be the most common. But think about us as humans and the number of times that we may urinate can be dictated by, does the cat drink a lot? Right. You know, and by a lot, I mean, just they're good drinkers. And so those good drinking cats are going to pee more than those that don't drink as well because they're not getting that water intake. Sure. So the two to four um, is what I would kind of say would be normal, but most importantly, and this is kind of what I've learned over the course of my career is when we're taking histories and my technicians are responsible for taking histories at our practice, they will go in, is your cat eating or drinking? So of course, most people are going to say yes or no. Um, they'll go, are they using the litter box? Yes, no. What I learned very early on is I always ask, have you noticed a change in eating, drinking, urination, defecation behavior? Because now it takes that two to four out of the equation. Right. Because right. now, and so that's what I can impress upon your listeners is learn what your cat's normal behavior is. Mm -hmm. Because then and only then are you going to be able to know when something has changed right. that you may want to have looked at. All of a sudden, stop urinating. That's an emergency. Because yeah. if they're not peeing, we're worried about obstruction, particularly in a male cat. If, you know, they're peeing too much differently than what they normally do, and you're seeing a lot of urine, that's an indication. Go figure it out. Is it a urinary tract infection like we talked about last week versus is this more of a kidney issue or right. diabetes or whatever we find once we start looking at it? 
And is urinating outside the litter box something that you see with kidney disease? And if so, why? Why, why would they go outside the litter box with kidney disease? So with kidney disease, I, I wouldn't attribute going outside the box necessarily, ooh, you know, kidney disease is the process because we know that they'll go outside the box with urinary tract infections. It's right. their way of kind of letting us know. Now, yes, do they urinate outside the box in kidney disease? Absolutely. If I had to get in the mind of my cat patient, my thought process would be that with kidney disease, they're going in because it's not going to necessarily result in an, a bad odor because of infection or, you know, you might not necessarily ever see blood, which again is another reason sometimes they'll start spotting elsewhere. It's because the box is filling up with urine more. And so it's not a very appealing place for them to want to get in the box. And so they probably yeah. venture outside. Um, and and but, maybe even in, because this, this, typically affects senior and geriatric cats if they if there's something else laying over that like arthritis or something like that and they're having to go so frequently and it's clear across the house and not convenient they might they might correct go. yeah yeah and so it, i mean it's on the list in a, inappropriate urination is always you're always going to be thinking kidney to your point At some point, particularly yeah. when you're dealing with that 7 plus year old feline patient that all of a sudden you're going, huh, they've been perfectly normal all this time. Yeah. You know, and this is one of the things that they're doing. And, and so in addition to increased urination, how is, is the cat suffering in any way at the early signs of kidney disease? Do they, do they feel discomfort? What, what's going on with them? You know, I think, um, you know, I always say I, I could make a lot of money if my patients could ever really tell me what it is they're feeling. Right. And, and so a lot of what I've always done is put a human aspect to things. And because I've had friends that have kidney issues, you know, think of, about the kidney infections that people get. I got to believe that what they're feeling is probably very similar to what our patients would experience. The thing that we know the most is um, with kidney disease, you get a buildup of BUN, which is blood, urea, nitrogen, and creatinine. Those are the two factors that are kidney indicators, creatinine being the more specific. When those increase, those create an issue within the system and they start to feel sick, they start to become nauseated because those values now are too high. And so painful, I would think painful would be more in the realm of the kidney disease is due to a cancerous process or kidney stones or you know things that create pain. So I've had kidney stones and they're incredibly painful. Um, when you have those and thankfully, once you get rid of them, the pain goes away and the kidneys go back to normal. Those values go up. I think when the kidneys are not functioning appropriately, because you start to get this buildup of toxins and the body's not able to, um, eliminate appropriately, it just makes them sick. And that's why you start flushing with fluids and things like that to try to help decrease the toxins within the system. I see. And how is it diagnosed? We, you know, we talked a little bit about that a, a second ago, but what tests are, are run and, you know, you talked about the, the bun and creatine levels, mm -hmm. obviously that's shown in, in blood uh, lab work, but what, how other ways do you diagnose kidney disease? Yeah. So we always start with physical exam and history because like I said, you do a physical exam, you can fill those kidneys very easily in a cat. And so but you do may they know, change, do they change in size if there's disease present? They can get larger or and or smaller. Okay. So you're so feeling to see if they feel size, shape, normal. Okay. You know, again, if you think about that kidney bean, you open up the can of red kidney beans to put in your chili <laughs> <laughs> and you look at that or 
you know, think about if that were to get bigger, it's going to lose that bean shape, that kidney bean shape, yeah. right? Um, and so we can sometimes get an indication on feel. Now, again, if you grab the kidney and you put pressure on the kidney and the cat responds, again, now that becomes an important part of that physical exam. The history we've already talked about, increased drinking, increased peeing, you're already thinking bladder, kidney, those, you know, the, primarily the urinary tract system. Um, then your analysis comes into play, you know, once again, because you see changes in specific gravity. If the cat's drinking more, oftentimes they're not able to concentrate the urine. And so you will see that drop, um, the specific gravity drop. You also, it's important as you're assessing for kidney function is if you find infection, you know, you guys start addressing that before you'd ever say, hey, we're in kidney disease. You know, yeah. doesn't mean we're not because there's something called pyelonephritis, um, which is an infection of the kidney, uh, you know, and so once you clear that up, you're going to be re repeating tests. Blood work, as you said, the BUN creatinine are important. As we get into later stages of kidney disease, the red blood cell, because if you remember at the beginning, I said that it creates uh, urethropoietin, which is which helps the body make red blood cells. It's not uncommon in chronic kidney disease to see anemia because the body's not producing the red blood cells the correct, you know, at the correct level. And so you see that happen. Phosphorus uh, becomes an important one. Um, I know you brought that up in conversations prior to this. So we see that become elevated in, in kidney disease. And so you start to put the urinalysis plus the blood work together. And then we have a couple other things. Uh, there's a test called SDMA, which is now pretty uh, common to use in kidney function. They believe it could be a little more sensitive to, than your BUN and creatinine. So we're, we're looking at that. We look at urine protein creatinine ratios. Um, which can help us determine, do we truly have um, protein in the urine? And oftentimes they're serial tests, your x-rays, your ultrasounds. So those are the things that we, you know, we would be thinking um, because just one test doesn't necessarily tell the entire picture. You know, you can have a high BUN and go, oh my gosh, we might have kidney disease, but the BUN is not just specific to, you know, right. the kidney creatinine is a more sensitive indicator of kidney function. SDMA yeah. becomes even more. They're using that a lot now to try to identify the potential of kidney disease before the BUN and creatinine ever become abnormal. I think I've told you this before, which is our bodies are so efficient at what they do. It takes 75% of kidney function to be gone oh, before wow. the BUN and creatinine are going to show it. Oh, wow. And that's, that's why when we're talking about longevity or long-term prognosis, you have 25% of kidney function left at, at most when you get that abnormal read. Wow. Yeah. You know, and so that, that's why it's so important to be in tune with everything because the sooner we start addressing it, yeah, you know, we might be able to start doing things before we get to that 75%. Yeah. I had a I had a cat that had kidney cancer and cancer was on one kidney. And so the reports were fine because the other kidney compensates and they were like, we know he has cancer. We just can't <laughs> seem to pinpoint where it is. And then, of course, right. in a in a postmortem diagnosis, then they were able to pinpoint it was on one kidney. So what causes it? I mean, obviously, if we don't really see that they have kidney disease until they've lost 75% of function, then I guess what, what causes it and what can we do to make sure, is there anything we can do to make sure our cats don't develop kidney disease? You know, I think when I think about true kidney disease, um, I'm, I'm always thinking about the, just the long-term wear and tear on the body. So you know, there are things we always look when we're thinking about kidney disease, you kind of think about pre-renal causes, those things that are impacting the system that would down the line impact the, 
kidney. So things like cardiac disease, if you have low cardiac output, that impacts the kidney because the kidney needs a certain pressure going through it to function at its highest. If you have high blood pressure, now there's too much pressure going through the kidney. And so, and again, that's a cardiac event. If you have severe vomiting diarrhea due to some other disease process, even cancer somewhere else, you're affecting the volume of fluid going through that kidney. So those are kind of your pre-renal causes. Then you have your renal causes. Well, you have urinary tract infections. And so you have the, the, the infection component, you have kidney infection, pyelonephritis, you have cancer, you brought that up, you know, so those directly impact at the, the kidney level. And then you have post, you know, so there's, um, think about now the things that would be post. Well, it's centered on the bladder. So do you have obstructive disease, uh, you know, cancer of the, the bladder, a problem in the ureter, anything that, again, prevents now the urine from getting out of the system and then the toxins start to build up. And so those are, are kind of the way we look at kidney disease. Um, as far as prevention, it goes back to everything else that we can talk about in every disease process, minimizing stress, making sure that, you know, they're feeding whatever diet you choose. As you know, um, it's, I don't talk a lot about nutrition just because there's so many different um, opinions out there, but feeding a diet that you feel is going to help the body and the patient thrive becomes important. You know, excesses are not uh, good, just like having, you know, not enough minerals and vitamins aren't good enough either. You know, you need that well-balanced diet, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, the right amount of sleep, the right amount of play. Unfortunately, the nature of what the kidney does means that the longer our patients live, and now we know they're living 17, 18, yeah. 19, we see cats at 21, 22 years of age. That's a lot of years that those kidneys are handling everything that that body sees. Yeah. Yeah. And I and don't so imagine, eventually it's going to. Yeah. And I don't imagine that the evolutionary process has caught up with that. I mean, very little, I think, has changed in a cat's kidney from its wildcat ancestors. And then right. their average life spans eight to 10 years. And so when you're talking about doubling that in average lifespan, it it makes sense that it's a right. it's a part that's going to fail. And it's it, it's, every, you know, it's every species, whether it's the human species yeah. or, or the canine, you know, the kidney is the kidney, what it does for them, it's doing for us, you know, yeah. and as we live longer, it's one of those organ systems that ultimately does fail as we age, you know, it's just one of those, you know, things we just lost. Um, unfortunately on the 19th of December, uh, my mother-in-law passed. Oh. Uh, now she had stage four ovarian cancer. And, but the cause of death was multi-system failure. Mm -hmm. We know what caused it, you know? So that's the impact that anything that's going on in our body impacts the kidney, impacts the liver. And so we could spend all our lives trying to prevent everything and Sure. Still lose. <laughs> and then, and to your point, if you, I mean, you know, you guys have to do so much more school because you're dealing with multiple species that can't talk to you. And so right. is Dr. Doolittle your favorite movie? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm still waiting for the day that I can understand my patients. <laughs> you know, I, I always joke that, you know, when we talk about feeding, for instance, when I talk to feeding with, with my patients, uh, pet parents. And one of the things I always said, because they go, how, why do you only feed your dog this one diet day in and day out? Right. You know, and it's important, particularly with something like kidney disease, right? Because you are going to need to be very cognizant of what you're feeding yes. moving forward. They eat to sustain life. The reason they start to develop 
preference is because we impart on them yes. that desire to understand flavors and things like that. You know, that's the whole marketing of diets out in the market. Um, but I said, I've fed my pets very specific diets for long periods of time. And I said, not once have I ever had any of my pets look at me one day and go, dude, I want something else to eat. Right. <laughs> Chicken again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, but I think it's important because when you, when you control diets and you're not in introducing, you know, you said, what can we do to, to maybe minimize understanding that when you find that diet that your pet likes, that's well-balanced, that meets their nutritional needs. If you feed that the entire life, you're minimizing introduction of too much, too little yeah. of things. And so I always try to impart in the ideal world, that's something that I think becomes very important on multiple levels because it's the same, you know, if all of a sudden they develop an allergy, if I've only fed one type of diet, I can break down that label. If they've eaten 50 different types of food. Right. It's a lot more. <laughs> it's a lot. Now, and now I know that two of the things that, you know, we're, since we're talking about diet, diet is one of the things in managing kidney disease that, that is in play. And mm -hmm. Protein, they, they always seem to recommend a, a low protein diet because the kidney's function obviously is to process protein. And so the more protein that that kidney is working on, the, the harder that is. And, and phosphate, right? Protein and phosphate, yeah. and maybe that's because phosphate's found uh, obviously mostly in protein. But as we know, cats being obligate carnivores, not omnivores like dogs, need protein and very little more than just meat and water. And so for a cat, how on earth do we actually lower that protein level and at the same time get the cat all of that animal protein that it needs as an obligate carnivore? How is that done? Or is it even done? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think it's proven it's been done, right? Because if if we think about it, and again, independent of, um, you know, <laughs> going down that rabbit hole of getting into nutrition, one of the first diets, prescription diets ever created was KD for the cat, right. you know, for, you know, for our dog and, and cat patients. Mm -hmm. And it was well studied that they were able to create a balance that, because they're well-balanced diets. I mean, they know that they have to maintain everything else at the appropriate levels, but they can impact by decreasing the phosphorus. Well, the high phosphorus increases damage to the kidney. So by lowering the phosphorus levels, you diminish the, um, you know, the potential damage that's occurring or you're slowing that process down. When we talk about decreasing protein or going to a lower protein level. I think what's important to understand is one of the ways around it is you can give them a lower level of protein, but use a higher quality. So they're able to get what they need to, again, to sustain their, you know, their life. There's that balance. I mean, the problem is, like you said, if you're giving them, um, you know, too much protein in kidney disease, it's just exacerbating the problem. It's going to speed that process up. And so it's the research shows that we know that we can reach that balance where we're helping the kidney and allowing the kidney to be able to reestablish the appropriate electrolyte levels in the body without having it work too hard that then makes the problem progress faster so it's that balance of once we once we're there unfortunately we have to do something you know and in addition to you know diets um a lot of things that we look for are supplements so you know we have the 
a pacotin, which is one of the phosphate binders that, that, that we use. And again, because we're trying to keep, you know, based on what the blood level shows dictates how much of that you need, or if you need it, right. it's normal. You don't need it right away. Um, there's a product called Azadil. Azadil helps bring BUN creatinine down. And so again, it's a supplement that we can provide to our patients to try to help them. If their blood pressure is high, putting them on blood pressure medicine. So um, amlodipine is one of the common ones that, that have been used to help bring blood pressure down. Ironically, just as we were um, talking, uh, or as I was kind of reviewing things for today, they came out with what's new in the management of feline chronic kidney disease. Mm. And so literally hitting, you know, products that have hit the market recently. Um, and I apologize. I'm, I'm reading it because this is all kind of hot off the press for me um, is, you know, there's a newer blood pressure medication. There's a, a product out there that helps keep their weight up. Mm -hmm. Um, Purina has come out with a hyd hydrocare, which basically is a nutrient enriched water um, supplement to help increase the daily intake of, of, of water. So you're trying to help with the dehydration component of things. And then, um, then for, there's another one that's come out that is an oral absorbent to try to help with some of the, you know, this downsides of renal disease, because one of the clinical symptoms we didn't talk about in our, in our feline patients is um, with renal disease, as those toxins build up, the BUN and the creatinine, one of the common things that we'll see are ulcers in the mouth. Oh. And some of us, uh, cats get what we call uremic breath. So sometimes when things are more advanced, we can sometimes just by the odor of their yeah. breath have a high suspicion that maybe kidneys are involved. Interesting. Interesting. And, what and so about things are constantly changing, which yeah. is only for the betterment of our patients. That's good. And, and what about like adding omega threes? You, you can't really overdose them on omega three, right? And that helps them to get some more of that fatty acids and amino acids and proteins and things that they need. Well, yeah. And I mean, let, you know, let's, one of the, one of the things that we've learned with, uh, the, you know, fatty acids or one of their big components is inflammatory. You know, they're helping with inflammatory products and inflammation and things like that. So absolutely. The only thing that I encourage again, as you said, you can't necessarily overdose them, but there's no if you're given too much, the body has to deal with it, which is just now one more thing the body has to process. And when we're dealing with a disease process, more isn't in the best interest of our patients. So, you know, I think it's always best to, you know, talk with their veterinarians and, and see first is omega-3 fatty acids. Um, should we introduce those as part of the regimen and then what product would they recommend and how much and how often those type of things, because let's face it, you can walk into any pharmacy and yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of different brands, a lot of, you know, and you want to just make sure that you're, you're picking the right one. Ultimately our job is to do our best to cause no harm. Right. And love my pet parents to death. But Dr. Google is awesome and helping them figure out what to give. And, and again, it, the most important thing I can always say is I am all for learning and doing as much research and just always have your veterinarian involved in the conversation so we can kind of help you pick out and, and do the appropriate things for your individual pet. Because what right. I might recommend for your pet is going to be different for the, for the next patient. Right. And what, and so other than diet, are there other things to, to treat kidney disease? I mean, a lot of, again, what we've kind of talked about them, it's, it's what we're seeing. So if you're seeing high blood pressure, we're going to get on blood pressure medicine. If we're seeing the phosphorus high, we need to try to bind that phosphorus. There are other phosphate binders than a packet. In. you know, like I said, 
we're dealing with cats and, and but all species think about again i always go back to the human we don't like everything and not everything settles with us and so it's knowing first they're reacting to it or they're not they're having difficulty with that particular medication or supplement what else can we do because it's, oftentimes we don't have just one option I won't say never just one option, but a lot of times we have other things that we can try to do. Um, you know, diet, obviously we've done uh, in our, in our patients. Uh, one of the common things that we start to teach clients is doing sub Q fluids at home, mm -hmm. you know, and again, that takes a very special pet parent and a very special cat because yeah. not all of our patients are going to be, um, open <laughs> yeah. to their owners doing that. And let's face it, some owners, not everybody's going to want to take a needle and right. put under their cat's skin. Um, you know, and, but that's something else that we can do as well, because we're always trying to maintain them and keep them as far away from dehydration as we can. Yeah, that's true. And, and I, Personally, I, that's one of the reasons I don't feed dry food and I always feed wet food with water added so that I'm keeping my cat's system flushed, you know, and healthy at all times. I, I have a foster kitten that, uh, that I was feeding some dry food because it's going on to another life and I don't want it, you know, want it to have a right. variety of, of food experiences and my cat Pico got into it. And I looked over and he was just drinking tons of water, you know, and he never really drinks water because he gets all the water he needs in his food. So he's not a, and I, and I was, at first I thought, oh my gosh, what's wrong? Why is he drinking so much water? And then I realized he had gotten into the dry food. So. <laughs> right. No. And, but, but see, that's so important, right? Because I think, I think the best thing that we can do with our patients and I don't care what disease process we want to throw out on the table right now. It's always about making sure you understand one, your pet's behaviors. When they sleep, when they don't sleep, when they eat, when they don't eat, when they drink, don't drink, when they pee or don't pee or pee, poop, all those things, watching their behaviors. When you see it, you want to recognize, hmm, didn't eat today. So then you watch. And if they go back to normal the next day, hey, we all skip a meal every now and then. Yeah, It's when it starts to be day two, day three, or they're not going back to normal because they got into dry food and needed to flush all that out at that point in time that, you know, if it just keeps continuing, I'm sure you've already stopped the dry food. So now right. it becomes more of an issue. And so that's the most important. The sooner we get particularly our cats. You and I talked about this before. Cats are infamous for hiding things sometimes to their detriment because we get to them too late. So anything that gives us the advantage, we have to play that game with them that we have to start looking at how they are in our environment and recognizing when they're changing. And understanding that change may be very significant, even though you may not think it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's the time you get them to the veterinarian. Right. And that's when they always start acting normal, right? It's just like the car that makes the noise until you take it to the mechanic and then it doesn't make the noise anymore. <laughs> right. But, you know, I much rather tell one of my patients that I find nothing. Right. They do nothing and then go, oh, by the way, your cat's in, you know, in stage renal failure. Yeah. And they go, oh my gosh, I'm such yeah. a bad pet parent. And you go, right. no, they just, unfortunately, this is the cat for you. They hide it until they get so sick, they can't hide it anymore. Yeah. And so you can't feel bad, you know, but that's again, why as a veterinarian, I am a huge proponent of annual visits, uh, doing routine yeah. blood work so we can identify small changes in blood because we're looking at it on a consistent level. And as you hit the senior years, twice a year visits, because the sooner we pick these things up, it just gives us an 
upper hand in some instances to prolong life even further than if we catch it when it's too far advanced. Yeah. Yeah. We do it for ourselves. You know, most of us, you know, we all, right. <laughs> I, I try to go to my doctor every year and yeah, do my blood work and things like that because I want to hopefully be around a sure. long time. Yeah. And, and, and to that point, what is it less than 50% of cat parents actually take their cats to the vet, mostly because it's such a stressful thing for everybody. But when you go to schedule your vet appointment, and if you haven't scheduled your vet appointment recently, go out to Amerivet, right? Veterinary partners yeah. and, and look at their network because they have a great network of veterinarians. And I noticed you've been at aggressively adding new practices <laughs> lately. So um, go yeah. out there and check out their, their clinics. There might be one near you that yeah. will be able to help you out with your cat issues. And I appreciate that. And, and, you know, and also I think that thanks to the long-term efforts, I, I believe you threw out Marty Becker one time during our conversation, um, that things have really changed in the veterinarian's eyes that we now understand the stresses of, of taking our patients to the veterinarian. And it is very acceptable now to help them sometimes with medications, sometimes with pheromone sprays. There are things that we can do now to help minimize that stress. And we're all open and willing to do that versus maybe 20 years ago when it was just like, just give them the dang carrier and drive them in. Don't <laughs> worry about it. You know, we can make it a less stressful experience for them which in turn will make it less stressful for our pet parent. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being with us and talking about this very important and, and sadly way too common topic sure. with, uh, with cat owners. And um, we look forward to having you on again next month. And I believe we're going to be talking about dental disease next time. So awesome. That's another. No, I, thank you for having me. And I, it's always a pleasure to spend some time with you. Yep. And thanks for tuning in with us today. Until next time, keep calm and purr on. Bye-bye, everybody.